This is going to be. Got it. Wait, I've started recording for posterity. Okay, this is the. Uh, I'm Michael Stewart, chair of the Carson Chamber Economic Development Committee. I am so happy to have you here for this meeting. Uh, we'll start this meeting uh, at uh, 11.07. Sorry for the delay. Today, uh, on Tuesday, September 21st, we're happy to have as our guest speakers, uh, representatives of Dignity Hill Park. Now, the Carson Chamber Economic Development Committee is well aware of this important economic generator in our city. And we're happy to have them to speak, and tell us the progress which they have. Uh, coming short term, mid term, and also their long term plans uh, for uh, the 2028 20, Olympics. I'd like to uh, start uh, the meeting. First of all, uh, we are here to help in the development of economic development in the city of Carson. We're happy to have you all here to listen to this update. And what our methodology is to showcase Carson. We want to impress our people with development and to bring good information. Okay, I'll start uh, this meeting by having our guest speaker uh, to be introduced by Barry Waite. Well, I don't know how much more I can say than most of you already know about Katie Pandolfo. Uh, she has been with the stadium for, when did you, you weren't there at the very beginning, but just like moments after, right? right? And yeah, so yeah. she has been a uh, part of our community now for longer than she'd like to admit as far as the passing of years, but I think they've been good years. And she's been very involved in the community uh, she's promoted a variety of activities and programs. She's promoted general economic uh, development, and she has uh, reached out to many businesses. Uh, we have had many programs there. The city has, the chamber has, many of our businesses have, and have always been uh, made to feel welcome. So we are thrilled to have you here today to talk about where we're going in the next few years from the sports standpoint. So I will just turn it over to you. All right, well, thank you, Barry. And good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. Um, and as Barry mentioned, yeah, I have been here in this city working at this building uh, for almost 18 years. So Tamala has me beat by about a year, uh, but I have been here since uh, very early 2004 um, when we were the Home Depot Center. Sure, lots of you remember that. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief presentation on I think kind of how we got here with the with the Olympics, but also um, and Barry, if you could maybe share that first slide that I that I sent you, um, you know, I think it's really important to show how dynamic Los Angeles is when it comes to hosting major events. Now, obviously, Tamil and I are very involved in the sports world. There are a number of other events that happen here. Um, but this is just a snapshot of what is coming to uh, our amazing region over the next, well, now eight years. Um, and, and these are huge, major economic driving events that are happening right in our backyard. Um, so going on the list this year, there's the MLS All-Star Game. Unfortunately, it was still kind of in the middle of a pandemic, um, so a little bit hard to judge the economic impact of that. But you know, starting next February with uh, Super Bowl, which they've been ramping up for for a number of years, and then the MLB All Star Game and the and the college playoffs and WrestleMania, um, and this November we will find out if LA is chosen as one of the host cities for uh, FIFA's World Cup in 2026, which I'm very confident Los Angeles will be chosen um, as one of those cities. And then our capstone right now is the 2028 Olympics, which we won that bid in 2017. So I think this is just a snapshot for everybody of these major economic drivers um, that come by way of sports that are coming to our region. 
uh, over the next 10 years. Um, so, you know, before we jump into the Olympics, I think it's always important to kind of look back and see how we got to where we are and how we can best take advantage of what we have coming up in the future. Um, so as most people have known, we at Los Angeles has hosted the Olympics, the Summer Olympics twice before, once in 1932 when the original Coliseum uh, was used and then again in 84. Um, and once again, the Coliseum was used kind of for opening closing ceremonies. So one of the only stadiums in the world that's been used for two and will be three Olympics. Um, one of the things that came out of the 1984 Olympics was this massive endowment. Um, the Olympics actually generated excess revenue, one of the only ones that generated excess revenue across the world, still one of the only ones um, that does when you're looking back at recent Olympics. And with that excess revenue, there was an endowment created, which is uh, LA84, which is an endowment that is still being operated to this day. Um, I don't have the exact numbers, but Carson has received somewhere in the range of $3 million um, since 1984 by way of this endowment that has gone back into youth programming. So whether it was track and field, rugby, um, soccer, cycling, trying to look at the list here, the Boys and Girls Club of Carson um, has received grants and funding from LA84. Um, so looking at this endowment and what it's done to LA um, and to really kind of look at and, and shape what sports are like for youth in our community is pretty tremendous. And we're one of the only cities that can say that we actually have done this. That endowment is still going strong. And after 20, uh, after 28, there will be another endowment that does even more good around our city. So um, I think looking back at that, you know, is one of the huge social impacts of having the Olympic, Ga Olympic Games that is still carrying us through today. So looking ahead to 28, um, you know, I think it's a really interesting story of how we actually got here um, and one that really just defines LA and our community. Uh, so back in 2014, when there were, when the IOC was was asking for bids for um, what was the 24 games, LA of course put our hat in the ring as a number of other cities did in the US. Um, we actually were beat out by Boston. They had never hosted the Olympics. And so the U.S. bid for the Olympics for 24 was awarded to Boston. Well, within six months of that, um, the community of Boston and, um, and everybody that lived in Boston, they said they didn't want it. <laughs> they said that it was going to be an economic burden. Um, they did not want to have the Olympic Games in Boston. So the USOC shifted and they came back to LA and they said, my gosh, we've wasted almost a year on Boston, but we need a US city to step up. And LA, of course, said, we would love to have the games. And they did a survey at the time in, in 20, it was late 2014, 15, and there was an 88% public approval rating of bringing the Olympics back to Los Angeles. There were that many people that knew how important it was to have the Olympics back here in LA and, and what that meant. And, and LA was just such an ultimate sports town and that we really wanted to have these games. Um, so LA was put uh, into the bid process and it came down to um, Los Angeles and Paris for the 24 games. And the IOC looked at both cities and said, you know, these are such strong bids that we would love to award both of you uh, the summer games, but we have to split it up. So Paris was awarded the 24 games, um, which is perfect for them because the last time they hosted the summer games was in 1924. So it'll be a hundred years later. And they will also be using some of the same facilities that they used back then. And then Los Angeles was awarded the 28 games. So in 2017, they actually came here to what was then the Sub Hub Center, uh, now Dignity Health Sports Park. And we had the women's national team of soccer here and they awarded Los Angeles the 2028 Olympic games. And, you know, I just love that story because it shows how passionate um, everybody here in Los Angeles is and how important it is to have big events here and how people recognize um, that those big events are economic drivers, they provide jobs, um, and just this, this sense and this feeling of, um, you know, Los Angeles is really the biggest sports town and, and the place to be. 
So uh, once we were awarded the, the, the actual games, um, we went through you know, a year process of really defining what sports um, went into these different pockets. And we are so fortunate here in Carson because really there's only um, four or five major areas around Los Angeles that will be hosting um, what they're calling these sports parks. So there is one in Long Beach that's a lot of water sports. There's one downtown um, that encompasses Staples Center and LA Live and the Convention Center. Um, there's one up in the Valley. Um, UCLA will be hosting the Athlete Village. And then we are hosting right now five events. Um, and whenever Barry gets to the next slide, it'll, it's kind of an overview uh, of what they're looking to do to our facility um, for the games. And it's, I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. And um, we, you know, we, we cannot wait um, for them to start looking at that. So um, what I think is so interesting about the 28 games and one thing that Los Angeles is really committed to is being the greenest, the most sustainable games um, in the history of the Olympics. There are no new major venues that have to be built in Los Angeles in order to meet all of the standards for um, the International Olympic Committee or the US Olympic Committee. And that is an absolute feat and, and a testament um, to what LA has to offer. Um, back in 2017, if you look at when they awarded the games, um, SoFi was literally a hole in the ground, but they knew it was going to be this amazing facility where they could potentially host opening or closing ceremonies and where they could host a lot of the events. Um, they knew that another soccer stadium, which is now Bank of California, was going to be built. So they had all of these different venues in the plan. Um, and as I said, the most sustainable, the greenest plan that had ever been put forth for an Olympic Games, which gave Los Angeles a huge edge, which I'm also convinced is why there's such a huge approval rating uh, from the general public um, is because one, there's no public funding that is going directly into funding the games. It has a completely balanced budget um, based on ticket sales, sponsorship, um, everything that's going into it. So, um, yeah, I think it's just an absolutely tremendous opportunity that that is coming our way. So because we were awarded the 28 games instead of the 24 games, there has definitely been um, I don't call it a quiet time, but you know, the last few years we knew there wasn't going to be much activity uh, around, you know, maybe even just minor capital improvements about building out what is necessary to have these these 28 games. The one thing that has been done, um, if you remember, I think it was Measure M or R a few years ago with all of the the um, metro and a lot of the transportation initiatives. Um, I believe a lot of those were those programs were meant to have an end time somewhere in 2035, but they were most of them were backed up to 2028. So we had our city ready from a public transportation standpoint um, by the time the Olympic Games came to Los Angeles. Um, so LAX and a lot of the rail lines and the bus lines, a lot of these improvements are meant to be done by 28. Um, to make sure that we are ready for this influx of people that, that are going to be coming into our you know, wonderful city. Um, and to back up to 2026, while it won't span as much time, but the FIFA World Cup, um, for those of you that remember 1994, LA had a number of games here, and that was another huge economic driver, people coming in from all over the world to attend these games. Um, 2026 will be the same thing. While our stadium is too small to actually host one of the big and premier games, we will be home to a training site for a number of, of the big teams, um, which for me is even more valuable. So instead of people coming in and out on one day or two days, we'll actually have people here um, for potentially 30 to 60 days as they are uh, in between games and as they come in to train for the World Cup. So when I look at impact to our region, um, while I'd love to have a big game, I think having the teams here is, is even more impactful um, and, and something that Carson can really look at and how do we capitalize on that. Um, but you know, getting back to the Olympics, there, there haven't been too many uh, economic impact studies 
done in the last few years. The, when the games were awarded in 2017, there was one done by um, UC Riverside, just looking at kind of the overall effects of Los Angeles, California, um, the whole country. And it was pretty staggering. I mean, the, the economic impact that they were projecting was definitely in the billions. Um, that year of the Olympics, they're looking at adding somewhere around 60,000 jobs to the LA area to support everything from the Olympics itself but then to everything ancillary that comes around the Olympics and all of these people coming to Los Angeles. Um, so, you know, the numbers are pretty impressive. And I think one of the things that I've been talking about for the last couple of years is how uh, do we as businesses in Carson and, and in this region, how do we take advantage of that? Um, and how do we capitalize on these opportunities of all of these folks that are going to be coming into Los Angeles and specifically coming to this venue in 2028 and 2026? Um, that would be one of my challenges to everybody on this call is to really think about how do we take this community um, and, and capitalize on, on all of these folks coming in? Um, you know, I know you can't snap your fingers and build hotels and, and all these things that, um, you know, might have these economic drivers, but there's some other smaller ones um, that I've even read about with the last couple of Olympics and some of these other major events where cities have taken a look at their ordinances when it comes to Airbnbs and VRBOs um, and really taking advantage of housing from that perspective. Uh, so, you know, how do we how do we look at those opportunities? Um, how do we talk about all of these major events coming in and and bring in major developers that want to take advantage of this uh, a couple of years from now? Um, so, I, I think the opportunities are endless. Um, I am so excited to have this to look forward to in, in 2028. And thank you, Barry, for putting up the picture. Um, for those of you that you know haven't heard me gush about what we're having here, let me take a quick look at the picture. Um, over in the upper right-hand corner, we're, we'll be hosting cycling in, in our current velodrome. Uh, we'll be having tennis and uh, the main tennis court, and then there's a couple other ancillary courts. The field right in the foreground there is for women's field hockey. Uh, and then in our main stadium will be rugby sevens, which is a new sport that was added the last couple of years. And then also the modern pentathlon. Um, and those are just the core sports. There is a possibility that more sports will be added, especially as the uh, Olympic Committee adds more sports over the year, um, which is something that they do uh, every time that there is a new Olympics. So um, like I said, amazing, amazing possibilities and opportunities that we have here. And it's just working together with this group and, and other groups in the city to how we take advantage of it. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. I will try and answer you know, whatever I can. Um, and if you just want to talk about all the major events, you know, happy to do that too. We can go grab coffee or lunch and <laughs> hear me keep talking about all the great things that are coming to our region. Uh, Katie, I have one question though. Is, uh, I know you've been working with uh, Caltrans and MTA on the movement of people. Can you explain how you're training and planning for the movement of people coming in and going out of a city? That's, that's a major question uh, for the community. Yeah, so, you know, they don't have all of their specific plans, you know, 100% nailed down yet. I think by the time they hit the Paris Games in 24, that'll be something that they've honed in on. But all of these major venues, um, they won't have parking right at the venue. And that's a, that's a security concern. You know, that's something that just helps the movement overall. So they will have these satellite parking areas for all of the different sports parks. Um, so you will go park in, in an outside area and then folks will be shuttled in. Um, we don't have all of the exact maps and we don't know where the, the exact location of the, the parking you know, locations are going to be. Um, but we do know that they're trying to avoid that influx of cars that are coming into these sports parks because there's multiple events going on at one time. 
Mm-hmm. So um, once they have the programs, I believe of, okay, if field hockey is happening on these three days and rugby is happening on these four days and then cycling is two weeks and these are how many people we're anticipating on selling tickets to, I think that's when we'll really hone in on the transportation plans. Um, but, you know, they're definitely committed um, to not having a, a burdensome traffic plan um, on, on the city itself. Well, so for those of us who uh, uh, lived through the 84 Olympics here in LA, and I suddenly feel old saying that, but anyway, um, I, I, work, I got to work in the Olympic Village working for USC security, and it was a blast. It really was a blast. I'm like, they're paying me for this. This is awesome. But, and people who weren't here don't believe it when we say there was no traffic, there was no crime, there was no smog, and believe it or not, it was way smoggier back in 84 than it is in 2021, just made a lot of progress. But it, it, is, it was really an amazing time. Mm-hmm. Um, we were all trading pins and, and meeting people from yes, all over the place, and it, it was just, it was, it was all very fun. Um, and the security was pretty amazing. The LAPD blew up a, uh, a very suspicious ice chest that uh, contained many sandwiches that were scattered to the winds at that point. But I mean, that was the kind of stuff that they had. Um, and so I think part of the reason there's so much support for doing the Olympics again is that anyone who was here for it has made it clear, like, look, this was, this was really a, a different sort of time. And it was after we'd had several really failed Olympics from an economic standpoint. They were just disasters, mm-hmm. cost a, a small fortune and left their communities in terrible shape. And here LA, you know, I think partly because of the Hollywood influence of knowing how to do something, uh, we just ramped it up, scaled it up and, and there it went. So I think that's part of why we're, part of why we have that level of support now that we're looking at and why I already volunteered for the 2028 Olympics two years ago. So I'm sorry, but I better let the chamber know I won't be available then. So I'm gonna be busy, but uh, David Gamboa, you had a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, very exciting as, as the games will be happening on campus. I know that we are well underway from the planning perspective between um, our university, AEG, among other partners. Should we be considering, and even with the city looking at a visitor's bureau in anticipation for the Olympics. Um, you know, obviously we have the chamber, but you know, we're, we're looking at a multi-year plan of how to really promote this region. Mm-hmm. And the Visitors Bureau in connection um, and in preparation for the Olympics uh, may not only help elevate our region, but take us to where we know we're gonna have to go eventually for the 2028 Olympics. Um, and this is an opportunity that um, who knows when we're going to be getting again. And so it's something to consider, potentially something to look at by bringing in all entities within this community and even outside of our region, but by seeing what that may entail, uh, you know, trying to make, as we all are, um, our area a destination location. And so, yeah. again, just something to really kind of think about, considering if we were to do so, this may be the reasoning on why to move it towards that direction. And the, I guess the other question was, as it, when do we anticipate really promoting the Olympics in our community? When is that really going to take place? Is that, gonna, is that a three-year plan leading into the Olympics, a two-year plan? So then, because there's a variety of different things outside of the city that we can do in order to really hone in that the games are going to be, um, you know, in our community. Good question. Do you want me to answer that? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, David, I think we've had this discussion before on some type of visitors bureau, uh, and I completely agree. You know, I think um, a city like Torrance, our neighbor, you know, has a great online visitors bureau called discover torrents um that's funded in part i think by some of the hotels but i I definitely think that carson should take advantage of something like that um that you know you can log on to an instagram or twitter or something and find things to do in our city and we can start promoting those now 
um, yeah, I, I think we absolutely can and it takes a small group of us to, to kind of get ready to do that for promotion. Um, you know, it, the Olympics are very tricky on how you can actually use some of their marks or their rings, but we can definitely work with the committee. If we came up with a plan on how we want to promote, they're willing to work with us. They have people already working in their community relations department that, that would um, definitely help us. We just have to come up with that plan. And whether it's uh, we want murals at every school over the next you know seven or eight years or public art displays kind of every year leading up until the Olympics. Um, I think they're absolutely open to that, but I think it would definitely be um, for us in the city to decide on what the best path forward is to start kind of announcing that we are hosting five different sports in the Olympics. I see, I see Taryn has a question. Hi, yes, um, Barry, um, it's good to hear of the previous success. I was born in 84, so this would be my first. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my question was, um, you mentioned that even though games won't be hosted here in Carson, it will be a practice facilities. What does that look like? Does that look like when NFL teams practice in like Oxnard or Irvine or things of that nature like what, what does that look like what can we expect so that's just for the world cup in 26 we will for the 28 olympics we will be hosting the events um, that i mentioned the five for the 2028 olympics but for 26 for the world cup uh, it means that teams just similar to like nfl training camps they would be here every day of the week training when they're not playing got it okay thank you mm -hmm. I have one other question concerning branding. How can we promote the community of Carson and our business community and the whole entire community through a branding process, through this planning uh, for the, uh, the Olympics? I mean, we need, we have a positive city. How can we make this brand known? Uh, and uh, because we want to be a site where people want to come and do business and go to restaurants and things, but we want to have the brand, a positive branding for our community. Yeah. I mean, I, I see uh, JR and Saeed on the phone. I think some of the things that other cities have done, I think Long Beach has already em embraced this and started putting on some of their taglines, um, home, you know, home of these events for the 2028 games. So that's definitely something that we can look at as a city and something that we can all, you know, tag on um, whether it's our signature lines or in everything that we do that just reinforces to everybody that we are the home uh, to, to probably five plus events for, for the game. So in, in my mind, it would be hiring a designer to come up with a slogan or, or, or some type of logo that, that we use consistently over the next um, seven or eight years to really talk about the Olympics coming to Carson. So let me yeah. jump in, Michael. Um, it, as you know, we we presented a, a couple of a couple of meetings ago that the city's undertaking an RFP process to select a economic strategic plan consultant, and uh, we've actually got interviews this week, and uh, hopefully, hopefully make it can make a recommendation to council, um, the subcommittee in the next week or so, and then uh, probably be in front of the council with a, with a contract and the presentation, uh, hopefully in October, maybe the second meeting in October. Um, the, um, you know, that, that process is very ambitious uh, or, or that RP and, and the scope is really ambitious and a big part of it. And you know, actually one of the planks in the, in the whole RP itself is, uh, is really an examination of the tourist you know, tourism, sports, and entertainment uh, economy, uh, in arts, in arts economy, in, in Carson, there's a whole, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole thread. Uh, some of the consultants that have actually brought in, as part of their project teams, very, very good hospitality consultants. Uh, some have brought in uh, branding uh, consultants. We think that the branding exercise would need to come really at the end of that process, and, and to sort of figure out what, you know, what what the what the city is first um, and you know, what we're trying to achieve. And then 
anyone that's gone through an actual branding exercise knows that it's a fairly, you know, it's, it's a fairly complex exercise and there's a lot, there's a lot into it. It's not the 27 of us on Zoom, you know, uh, throwing out slogans and ideas and then voting on it. And then, you know, that's it. And then we're going to go, that's going to be our brand. I mean, there, uh, usually there's research and surveys and, and really sort of testing it. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, we're in the, we're in the middle of that. And we think that by, um, you know, this time, probably, I, I would say conservatively this time next year, but hopefully even earlier than that, you know, we'll, we'll be concluded with the strategic plan and we'll be, we'll be into the actual community-wide branding process. And, 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 and that's really for Carson. And, and what we're hoping is that it's a really an umbrella brand that incorporates, you know, um, uh, it, it captures at least the sense of the university and big new health and some of the other things, uh, the assets of the community and, and really the community itself. And when you start to think how complex Carson is, and, and a lot of things that are very, very different from one another, um, you know, that's going to be a very, very interesting exercise to try to figure out what, you know, what it's all about. Thanks, JR. Uh, Mike Matoma has a question. Yeah, I have a couple of comments. Can you hear me, Barry? Yes. I'm here. I muted myself to tell you. Okay. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> first, first of all, you know, uh, last Wednesday, my wife was honored in throwing in the game ball for the Galaxy game against Houston. Her hospital, St. Mary's, which is part of Dignity Health, uh, I voted her health care worker of the year. So she was able to throw in the game. Again, if you don't really don't throw in the game ball, you hand the game ball to the, uh, what do they call them? The, to the referees? No, the, the, the team the, captain. No, the guy that's in that funny outfit, the mascot, yeah. Oh, to cause it. Had to hand the game ball to the mascot, but she got her picture taken and the mascot tried to hug her and she's going, COVID, COVID. <laughs> anyway, second of all, Katie, my, uh, her brother is on the Special Olympics Committee, the International Special Olympics Committee. So he's looking forward to coming to Carson and participating with you know with you and going into the stadium for for Special Olympics. Anyway, the you know and also Katie, the you know the CEO of the hospital was looking forward to had a chance to meet you, but unfortunately, I guess your your schedule didn't allow you to go up and see her in the suite. So, but she sends her regards to you, and you have a great venue. You know, she uh, dignity dignity health is very proud to have their name associated with the stadium. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, absolutely. She did a great job Thanks. with the ball delivery. <laughs> and, and, uh, and also being a good lesson there of, okay, that's, this is not how we do it. So our friend, yeah, Ms. Right. Cook, yeah. we have our friend yeah. Ms. Cooks from the uh, South Bay One Stop here in Carson. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, congratulations on all the the, the absolutely uh, wonderful opportunities that, that are going to be in Carson. But on the employment side, I know that you mentioned tens of thousands of jobs that are going to be created by the Olympics. Um, and I just wanted to to let you know that South Bay Web and Carson uh, AJCC specifically would love to be a part of any um, um, thought. Um, or be thought partners in this process on how to either recruit or place or any, even offer any trainings to individuals that are going to, to actually be in need of those jobs. So just when I know that it's 2028 and it's kind of a long way out, but it's not that long uh, of a, a time span. And so just if you guys are in the process of thinking about those kinds of things that we are absolutely um, in, in position to be thought partners in that process. And just is, let me put this together that um, in the chat, we have a question from uh, Jeannie Hernandez at uh, Win Chevy Hyundai um, asking about who used to work for the job clearing house, which Sherelle now manages as the South Bay One Stop. Um, and she used to work at the chamber, so all tied mm -hmm. back together. And she's asking about how many um, local youth and adults will be hired and how we'll manage that. So I mean, clearly this is gonna be 
a serious issue and we're gonna be looking about at some long-term employment. And some of this is gonna be going on for years ahead of time. And some of it will be just for the events and, and uh, we'll have lots of opportunities, uh, volunteer opportunities as, as well, as I understand it. So we wanna make sure that uh, we reach out to our own community and give people these opportunities and let me add to that, we want to make sure that our local businesses, our small businesses, hey, well. get a chance to participate because um, they have a lot to add. They have the flavor. Literally, they have the flavor to add. So um, I think we'll all want to keep that in mind. Because mm -hmm. uh, many cases, uh, the local businesses want to add to the effort, want to join in, and also that promotes uh, the activity of, of building for the Olympics. And also as the Olympics builds and that effort builds, it builds the effort of sustainable business in our communities. Mr. Chang, I see Mr. Chang there. I like. Yes, I'm and taking in all the comments that was made and I wanted to thank Katie uh, for the wonderful job her and her team at Dignity Health uh, Sports Complex have been doing for the community. Uh, we certainly have a lot to look forward to and um, it'll take action uh, to, uh, to, to make sure that we can be as helpful as we can uh, to those that uh, are really some of the decision makers. So I'm glad we're in good hands. Uh, with all of you and the interest is there. So the progress will be uh, forthcoming. So thank you again, Katie. Yeah, my pleasure. So I have a comment. Any oh, other questions? Well, I, I just had a comment, if, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, on, I, on that last um, slide that Barry had put up, it's, I think it was titled something like the South Bay Sports uh, something or other. I, when I first saw it, I was thinking that was a, um, a combination photo of all the various venues that the Olympics would entail, you know, in, in, uh, during their stay here, you know, like the, the, uh, the SoFi Center and the and the dignity and Long Beach and all of that. And I and when she started naming it off, I realized that that was all dignity. <laughs> that was all dignity. That was not, you know, a little bit of, of Inglewood, SoFi, a little bit of Long Beach, a little bit of somebody else. That was all right here. And it is, you know, I was thinking that was a compilation photo that that they put, you know, the the football stadium and the and the soccer stadium and the, you know, swimming and tennis and all of that together. And I, I, you know, as Katie was uh, explaining, I was realizing that that's all right here. You know, we have all that in our backyard. You know, that is wonderful, you know, that, that we have a, a facility like that, that, uh, that would entail everything that's needed for a, uh, a complete sports complex. So that, that was just a comment I wanted to make because uh, I was thinking it was just a, uh, you know, a, a, a composite photo. <laughs> All nope. the LA offered, you know, I, uh, events, uh, venues. That is just Carson. That is just Yeah, a yeah that's, that's <laughs> wonderful. That, that represents foresight. <laughs> yeah, I guess made. so. <laughs> I guess yeah. so. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, you know, one thing that I didn't mention during the presentation, but was really important, you know, we've, we've obviously changed our title sponsor a couple of times and right. we were uh, Home Depot Center and we were StubHub Center. And one of the very important things to Dignity Health was when the Olympics come in or the World Cup comes in, um, you're not allowed to have any of your corporate partners. Any of that branding has to go away. It's one of the, the oh. agreements in the contract. So 
you won't see any signs that say Coca-Cola or American Express, any of our partners. Um, but we made the very conscious choice to change our name to Dignity Health Sports Park because for the Olympics, we are the South Bay Sports Park. So there will be this immediate association with where you're at because we will have been called the sports park for the last 10 years. So these other venues, the downtown sports park, really, uh, you know, that has Staples Center and the Bank California and the Coliseum, but there's not going to be that same association. So Dignity Health um, while their name won't be on it, I think there's going to be this massive association that we will have built over uh, 10 years by associating Sports Park with their name. So okay. good move. Good move. Yeah, because when I just saw South Bay Sports Park, that's what I said. I thought it was a, a compilation of, of all the various, uh, you know, centers that will be used for the Olympics. And I didn't realize that was all just dignity. Yeah, just Carson. Mm -hmm. Exciting times. Well, that is that is great. Thank you so much for sharing that. We're going to switch gears now, and um, I'm going to talk a little economic data, because as you all know, I love me some data. Uh, <laughs> so hang on a second here. So this is information that was provided uh, yesterday in their briefing by the LA County Economic Development Corporation. So, which we have been a member of in the past and um, are looking to do again. And um, I'm not sure if the city's a member of the LAEDC now, but has been in the past as well. So, um, well, a whole variety of things here to talk about. So, uh, it seems that the Delta surge um, is in decline and we have some data on that. Uh, the supplemental unemployment benefits have expired and that has some impacts. And also the eviction moratoriums are ending. So here's one that uh, we've all noticed, which is inflation. Um, and I think actually the next one, yeah, okay, this is actually a little more useful, which shows that, yeah, we had that big spike that uh, was what, March, April, May, and then it is really leveled out. If you remove the volatile food and energy, sectors, you can see it's actually the whole thing's much more muted. Um, we're still above where we were by quite a bit. Um, and the Federal Reserve has taken note of that and is trying to walk that tightrope between um, keeping the economy going and keeping the economy not overrunning. So um, that's where we are today. But it is definitely, as you can see here, definitely in the last few months, let's see, roughly April-ish is when you could see that we'd passed the point of inflection and we're headed in a much more moderate direction now. Although it's funny, also having grown up in the 70s, 4% uh, inflation would have been like a dream to us then, but um, now we're spoiled and we're used to being inflation rate down the 2% range. Uh, here looking at gas prices and we can see where that's been in the last couple of years. Uh, gas prices are also always volatile. Um, price of crude has climbed back up. That has an impact on the Carson economy uh, related to the oil industry in various ways. We have uh, some of our refinery operations are also producers. Some of them are only consumers of oil. They buy their oil from other companies. And so they don't really, it doesn't impact them in the same way when the price of crude changes. But again, we can see that that has, has tapered off um, and has actually slid back down a little bit. And part of that, of course, is for quite a while here, we didn't go anywhere. It was like going to the gas station was a fun activity because we'd almost forgotten how to do it. So I literally went two months without getting gas in my car because there was nowhere to go. So <laughs> we need to recognize that uh, in this case, that increased demand is a good sign. So let's look at a few key sectors, uh, global trade being a big one. And so um, let's look at these numbers here. I think is more helpful. You can see how imports dropped then in which it always drops off about Christmas time, actually usually about November. Um, but in this case, we had a much deeper drop um, interestingly enough, you can see exports, on the other hand, 
were pretty, uh, pretty stable. Um, and at this, this point, we still have, as you probably heard, a huge backlog of ships sitting off of the port, uh, the ports ready to come in. Um, the logistical challenges remain. Uh, on NPR this morning, they were saying that the, uh, the, whereas somebody may normally have done a five week turnaround, now they're looking at a 10 week turnaround and that those logistical challenges are a problem. This isn't a local issue. This isn't a county issue. This isn't a US issue. These are global issues. A lot of problems in China on the other ends of the supply lines um, and through countries throughout the world where they, in some cases, they don't have crews to load the ships. Um, so they figured that's probably gonna be another year before that gets worked out. Travel and tourism just went down to near nil here. You can see particularly the international and the international is still slowly climbing. And uh, it's, it's a split between people who aren't allowed to travel and people who just don't want to. And I think we're all a little leery of travel. Um, my wife and I went to Rhode Island to see our son in um, July and it, it was definitely a less uh, fun experience of travel than we had in the past and you know, kind of given everybody the eye like, uh, am I safe to be on the plane with you? Well, you multiply that times everybody on the plane and you can see that people just are not so excited about that. Domestic travel has climbed way back though from where we were. Um, it looks like we've got a little drop off after this point, um, but that's kind of normal seasonal anyway. Hotel occupancy has also recovered uh, mostly at this point, we're close to 70%. So you can't see it out here, but uh, they told us that we're looking at more like a 70% rate now. So. That's a vast improvement. Sit down dining is still hurting. Uh, you know, this is where we came from back in February of, of 2020. And uh, we're still not back to that level. And of course, you know, you can see this, this trough here when we had the, 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 well, actually the third COVID wave and how much that impacted us. Um, and again, that continues. Okay. Um, this is a great graphic representation explaining where we've been. So we all knew the second wave was something, but when you see it laid out like this, you realize the third wave, that was the nasty one. And you can see that we have definitely peaked on this most recent round. And this is very telling. It's uh, unvaccinated people who are the cases. And uh, yeah, what can we say? Just look at this, unvaccinated cases per 100,000, 71. Vaccinated cases per 100,000, 8.9. So like, that, that's roughly nine to one. Looking at the vaccine distribution, you can see Carson is one of the areas actually with a higher vaccination rate than overall. So something to be very pleased with. My own little Lomita here, we seem to be a little bit behind the curve. So I'm gonna to have to go bug some people at home. Um, and it's the, the, uh, the high desert area has a lower rate and some other communities here in between. Uh, the rate of vaccination among seniors is 91%. So what we're seeing now, of course, is a much higher case rate amongst younger people who thought they were immortal. Unemployment claims have dropped off quite a bit. That's definitely looking better. Let's look at some individual sectors though and where they're coming from. Still a lot from accommodation and food service that you know, it's still very volatile. And yes, we know that companies are having trouble hiring, but that's not new. If you go back a couple of years, you will see even three and four years, you'll see it was already challenging to hire in this area. And the pandemic has made it much worse. I know some of you have told me that, you, you know, who are in these industries, that your own staff is very frustrated with dealing with the public and, and being treated poorly. And, you know, 
makes it tough. So I graduated all of you for treating your employees well and, and, uh, and taking care of them. Um, and what else here? To, oh, actually, let's look at this coming up. And we can see how, uh, how the various unemployment programs have added uh, to the, the funds that were available. Looking at the labor force, you can see we had quite a drop off here. You all know that. Note this is not a zero based scale, so it's actually exaggerating the change. Just to clarify that. And uh, now we're, we're looking at another part of this where it looks like what's happening is we have a lot of people who are retiring. Um, and a big chunk of that is just, uh, it, it's they, the baby boomers have hit that age and, um, and are ready to move on. And also uh, challenges in the job market have made some of them say, decide that this is the time when they wanna leave. So we actually need to bring people back into the job market now. Some of those who have left, just looking at this, you can see the drop off here is just, just stunning how fast that was. The dot-com bubble, you can see a bit of a trend line down. Great recession, you can see a severe trend line down, but nothing like COVID-19 where it's, I mean, that's nearly vertical. And you can also see how much of that we've recovered. Look at the unemployment rate. We've gone from, you know, we were at 4.8% in August of uh, uh, 2019, and now we're at 9.7%. So, you know, roughly double. Um, historically, it's not a terrible rate, but it sure ain't good either. And looking at that in another fashion. Monthly change in county payroll. And uh, so looking at how we've seen the change here and you can see has definitely uh, cleaned up here. Uh, some of this was statistical anomalies. Okay, <clears throat> this is um, ignore the top line because the top line is teachers going back to school. And so it definitely distorts that. It's not like they're really unemployed, but that's how the system works. So if we look at the lines below that, you see the information sectors really picked up. Uh, professional business services, um, logistics industry, construction, construction continues to do well. On the other end, retail trade continues to be shedding. Um, Real estate, rental, and leasing. I just don't know who can find any place. It's the irony of that. And wholesale trade still, still looking negative. Okay, so looking at year over year, this is just fascinating. So um, you see accommodation food services really picked up, but they were also the ones who really got creamed. So this is just coming back even. Um, same with arts, entertainment, and recreation, which these are much more high paying than the sector, generally speaking. And then um, looking at the other end, of course, there's the, the total job loss. So if we go back to August 19th, so you can see uh, there was a lot of room to be made up there. And that is all I have, to, that's all I've got to say about that as the saying goes. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, again, that was thanks to our friends at the LAEDC. And, um, oh, here's something important. Um, so for a lot more of this and a lot more useful information, I would direct you to the economic um, forecast coming up at Cal State Dominguez Hills on October 28th. And uh, we're partnering with them to make sure that everybody knows about this. So we've been uh, banging on doors to remind people this is a great program. It'll be an in-person program. And it also includes a lovely beer and wine. Uh, I don't know what we're calling it. I'll call it a fest because anything's better if it's a fest. Uh, anyway, except- yeah we're, we're, yeah, we're calling it a reception. Thank you so much, Barry. Um, the South Bay Economic Forecast that is led by our faculty within the South Bay Economic Institute 
from our College of Business Administration and Public Policy. Um, we'll be going in depth in what Barry just uh, presented, focusing on the South Bay communities, um, talking about what economic changes did COVID-19 accelerate, um, what are we looking at when it comes to inflation, um, changing concepts within the industry. We have a, a very remarkable lineup of speakers. We always appreciate the Carson community, specifically the business community, um, attending this program. So a lot of information focused on the South Bay and they will go over Carson and the surrounding communities. So our faculty put this on annually and I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, back on campus on October 28th. We call it a reception fest. So it's the forecast followed by reception. Reception fest. Got it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, David. And so Was it's there a, any it's like uh, marketing materials for that? Yeah, and so, uh, we've, uh, we have sent that out uh, on our e-blast and I'm happy to send that to anybody else who would like that. Uh, Taryn, you're on our list, aren't you? I am, but I don't remember seeing anything. Well, let's fix that. So I want to make sure you get the one from Barry because there's a special rate for Carson Chamber members at $95 to attend, and that is uh, for Carson Chamber members. So um, I can send you that as well, but the information that Barry is going to be sending is specific to the Chamber. Yeah, I have your email address, so Taryn, I'll send you that in just a couple minutes. Thank you. You bet. And it's good to have, it's good to have a variety of businesses represented there, a variety of sectors. Um, because our economy is hardly monolithic. Our economy is very diverse, both locally and regionally, and, um, and certainly the chamber is as well. So we wanna make sure that, that, uh, you know, that we're all included in this. Are there any other questions for Barry? Okay, any more? Barry, that was excellent. Thank you for that overview. Thank you, and, uh, and again, that was from the LAEDC, so I had other information I was gonna present, and I thought what they showed, especially since it was just yesterday, being yeah. so current, I thought that was some good stuff that um, I wanted to share with you. So thank, thank you, you again to our friends at the LAEDC. Thank you very much. Well, uh, there are some items that the Economic Development Committee will be looking at in the future. Uh, one of those is how we could work with the uh, intern programs that Cal State Dominguez Hills have. So we're gonna probably wanna have a good discussion with that uh, next month, uh, David and, uh, and Ms. Cooks. Uh, our thing is to find out how those interns can work with the local uh, businesses and bring their, especially for our small and and mama papas and other businesses and also our medium businesses, how they can bring their particular talents to help some of those businesses with that expertise and how that could apply to our businesses. And that's something we would like to talk to Cal State Dominguez Hills probably next month if, if you're available. And we'll we'll send that to to Ms. Cooks. I know she was on this uh, on this uh, a call list. Other thing is that I'm very interested, we're very interested in is we'll be discussing the budget process in Carson. We want to see how the monies will be uh, uh, allocated and how they're playing for next year. So that's a longer view. And we keep hearing about this performing arts and conference center. Is that going to be at Cal State Dominguez Hills, David, or where is that going to be? Where does the city want to put that? And maybe John can answer that. It, it, it is within the, it was within the hopes and dreams of what uh, we can inspire to do towards a collaboration. So nothing definite right now. Um, we are just exploring a variety of different options as uh, we want to continue working with our city, but also uh, meet the needs of the community as well. Okay. Well, that's where we're going uh, in the future. And I want to thank all of you uh, for attending this important meeting. We're very happy to have this economic generate, this uh, stalwart part of our community, which is Dignity Health Sports Bar, uh, to discuss their plans and aspirations and how they want to help us grow in the city of Carson. With that, I believe that we can end this uh, meeting and thank you all for attending.
Thank Thanks, you. everybody. We'll see you soon. Thanks. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello and goodbye, everybody. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.